worship the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless your name this morning. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you are, all that you do, and all that you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that your word cannot fail. And we thank you, Lord, even for your faith that keeps us, Lord. When we would waver, when we would give up, we know, Lord, that there is no giving up in you. There is no end to you and to your goodness and to your mercy. Hallelujah. Whatever you have spoken shall come to pass. Hallelujah, Lord. We celebrate that right now. We celebrate, Lord, the surety, amen, of your word in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Give me a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and grandmothers. And praise the Lord. Thank you, Tim, for opening. Great job. Thank you, Suzanne and the worship team. They're, they're doing some novel things. I mean, it was good, wasn't it? I thought just... It was good. I mean, it came out real well. Thank you, Rick. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'm sure not. It was... I pray to God. I won't go there, but I was thinking of something. Praise the Lord. But anyway, praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Thank you, uh, Mike, back there on the sound, and uh, Eric, working away as ever. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Appreciate it. And now uh, Peter's doing double duty. He's going to do the, the scripture. So, man of many talents, multifaceted. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you all for your testimonies and your encouraging words. Amen, and uh, the opportunity to pray with you and pray for the needs that, uh, amen, are most prevalent in your lives. Praise the Lord. Grateful for that. I was thinking about a guy that uh, had a tavern, and it was haunted. It was, it was just really freaky. He, he, he uh, got this priest to come and do an exorcism on the tavern, and he asked the, asked the priest, he said, why in the world would a ghost want to haunt a tavern? And the priest said, for the booze. <laughs> Kids can use that at Halloween next year, praise the Lord. Praise God. For the booze, praise God. Well, praise the Lord. God's in a good mood all the time, amen, hallelujah. That probably didn't help him any, but it's, you know, he's already, he was already there, praise God. So again, happy Mother's Day. Appreciate our mothers for sure. Uh, amen. Without them, where would we be, right? Praise God. But uh, let's go uh, right to uh, Psalms chapter 24, and I want to read verses 1 through 6, Peter. Psalms 24, verses 1 through 6. And I'm gonna, I just want to, you know, Jesus, whenever he taught, he taught, in types and shadows and parables and metaphors and so that's what I'm trying to do and uh, and I'll try to point them out to you if they may be a little vague sometimes but I think that uh, you know once you kind of get in the flow of it they just come alive to you you see it automatically and I think that's why uh, Jesus taught that way plus the scriptures tell us itself that uh, everything was done in types and shadows throughout the Old Testament to point us to the reality of Jesus and what he's doing in our lives and who he is, uh, ultimately, amen. So, uh, in the psalm, the psalmist says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. So that is a summary of what it means to be a godly person. I've used this scripture before. Uh, I know for years I used to read that and it just almost haunted me uh, because of this. Who's, who's able to come to the throne of God? guy with the clean hands, amen, the one that is doing everything perfectly, right? So that's what godly humanity looks like. And this, this is David, amen, corrupted, afflicted, persecuted, amen, 
We know most of us some things about the life of David. And the question he asks is, who will go to the place where God is? Amen? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. Do you fit that description? I ask myself. I can imagine David praying this, saying this, you know. Have you ever lived in a falsehood or made a promise that you didn't keep or couldn't keep? Are you innocent of those things? If your answer is yes, then you're automatically guilty. That's why I didn't ask anybody to raise their hand. If your answer is yes, anybody who says they've never lived according to a falsehood, falsehood or an untruth is a liar. Gotcha. That's, that's what David is saying here. Amen. And so David saying the one who will receive God's favor is the one who's perfect. David was far from perfect. And yet, God called him a man after his own heart. How's that possible? How is it possible that we, who, like David, fail every day to live up to this ideal, this holy standard of perfection, can still be considered by God to be perfect and holy? Jesus Christ. What, this is the great kind of foresight that, that David had and what made him a man after God's own heart. He, he could see in God this, this beauty, this, this grace, this love, this mercy that others couldn't seem to follow. He could see God in the flesh. Amen? 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3, Peter. 1 John 4, 2 and 3. Now, this is interesting to me, and, and we're going to kind of get into some of these metaphors here to, right off the bat. But he says, Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. This might seem like a mundane scripture, but there's a lot of power in this thing. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now we know, you can watch these last, time, last days preachers, and they're talking the Antichrist and the beast and the, all these things. I'm telling you, this book of Revelation is something altogether different than what we have made it out to be religiously. It is just a lot of metaphors and a lot of symbols, a lot of types that, that have been taught all through the entire Bible. And it just carries that theme right on into the book of Revelation. It isn't like something altogether different. It's only when we start looking at it differently that it becomes bizarre. I mean, when we look at it as literal. Okay? So denying, this is what he's saying. Denying that Jesus Christ was really, literally, a man is Antichrist. Yes, yes. See, religion, it's easy to say, well, you know, Jesus was fully man. And then talk as though it's just nothing but God working here. No, the very fact that he had to be a man in order to, re to redeem us. A man lost us. It had to be a man to come and redeem us. Otherwise, God would have been as illegal in this world as Satan. You've got to have a body. You've got to have a human body, amen, to redeem human beings. And that's what God did. He became fully man in the person of Jesus Christ. To deny that is antichrist. Praise the Lord. That spirit was already here when Jesus came because there were people denying that He was the Christ, that He was the Messiah, that He was God in flesh. Amen? And so to be pro-Christ is to accept and admit that God really did incarnate Himself in actual flesh and bone. That is to be Christian or pro-Christ. Anything that doesn't agree with that is anti-Christ. It's not some boogeyman. It's a spirit. Yes. And it was in the world then, and it's still here now, and it will become even more dominant or more obvious in the last days. Yes. And we can see it in our own culture. We can see it all around the world. You can see it almost anywhere that you want to take the time to look at it. Yes. Amen. So look at 2 Corinthians now, chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. 
2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 17. And I want to talk to you this morning about what I think God is doing in this church, and I'm sure in other churches, but I'm just focused on this and the people that are here. Because God's got a destiny for every one of us. And they may seem different if we were to share what God is telling one person or the other. But the truth is, they have a common destiny, yes. amen, that God wants to do in this generation. Yes. Praise the Lord. And the generation is not one that has, I mean, God knows, but I'm not saying it, I'm, I'm saying it isn't one you could have written down somewhere back 300 years ago and said this will be the one. The generation he's talking about is the one who will respond. Yeah. The one who will have the revelation and the understanding to react to it in the way that God intended us to do it. Exactly. So, and I'm saying it's this generation because I can see it being taught. I can see more and more of this understanding. And I, did, I hear it even, you know, from y'all when we're having testimonies and so forth. Right. I'm hearing things that I never heard before in church. Right. I mean, in terms of how we're relating to God and how God is moving and operating in our life. That's because God is taking on a whole new dimension in a lot of ways. Amen? Yes. And that He died for all, that they, should, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So, we are flesh and blood, but we also are the carriers of God. Just exactly as Jesus did when He was here. The difference was Jesus knew He had an awareness of this that we haven't had. Because we've had this, this kind of struggling back and forth with religion telling us, you know, well, you're a sinner, but you're this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. The truth is that we were finished. We were born again, just as Jesus was born into this world, a human being filled with the, the Spirit of God. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Him bodily, and we are, and He is in us. Amen? So we have that same reality. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen? So Ephesians chapter 4 now, verses 17, and I'm going to read a little lengthy here. Uh, Ephesians 4, 17 through 30. And just... Kind of try to stay with me this morning. I've got a lot of scriptures, but it's because I'm trying to keep this connected to the Bible. So you don't think I'm just getting off on some rant, you know, or just some different thought. It's Bible. It's biblical. It's, it's the Word of God. Amen? So this I say, therefore, and testify in, in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Can you see the separate? what he's saying is, unless we see ourselves as Jesus, there's a separation from us and God. We don't, we don't connect the way we're supposed to connect, the way Jesus connected. Amen. Who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor and working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So anything that doesn't agree with this is com corrupt communication. That's what he's talking about that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Born again, you, are sealed. you have a seal on you, amen, which is the Holy Spirit. Yes. That seals you or sanctifies you or protects you or whatever you, however you want to define that until we're all out of here. Yeah. Until we get a glorified body, amen, whether that's in the rapture or, you know, in death and resurrection, however. So you are 
Christian. Christ, a Christ man or woman. Mm -hmm. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Humanity, people, human beings filled with God. Yes. That's your identity. That's who you are. Amen. That's how God sees you. And that's God's purposes and plans are all based on this reality. Exactly. It doesn't operate outside of this, this way, this, this understanding. Amen. Spirit life. The spirit of life of Christ Jesus in us. Praise the Lord. It's, it's Christ. It's God's nature in a human being. Amen. He talks about it several places in the scripture. We have received his divine nature by these precious promises. We have the nature of God. Amen. And here's Satan's purpose is to keep you unaware and dominated by the flesh. Keep a veil. Keep something between that reality and your understanding. Amen. That is Antichrist. That is the beast nature that he wants to keep you functioning in. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. So let's go now to John chapter 15, verses 10 through 12. John 15, 10 through 12. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. It's a lot easier for us. Well, I won't say it's easy, but there are fewer commandments for us to keep. Yeah. In another place he talks about, if, if you know you love the Lord your God and love one another. Uh, I was thinking, you know, Don talked about this a couple weeks ago. And it really triggered some things in my mind about that. But the point is, you have fulfilled all the law and the prophets by doing those things. The first and greatest is to love the Lord and then love your neighbor as yourself. These are the commandment that he says, this is the new commandment that I give you. Period. All right. Let's look at uh, Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 4 through 17. Galatians 5. 4 through 17. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now before I go on any further, let me just give this uh, on the side here. He says if you're trying to live by the law, you've fallen from grace. Well, grace is the only way that we can experience this reality of being a human being filled with God. It's the only way it can work. Religion undermines the whole thing. In a lot of ways, religion is antichrist. Because it's trying to tell you that you have to be, you, you can't, that you can somehow become God by doing certain things, by doing certain stuff. And you can't. That's why he had to bring grace. That's why Jesus had to come to fulfill all the law so that we could be God beings, so that we could be children of God. Jesus said it himself. He said, you know, you, you guys are freaking out about me saying that I'm the son of God. He said, your own scriptures tell you, are ye not gods? Yes. Little g, children of God. Yes. So they didn't understand it, and they attacked. Well, this is what happens with religion. When you start talking this way, they think you're some kind of a nutcase or on a, you know, this totally bizarre ego trip of some kind. It's not the case. Unless we, unless we understand this is our reality, we'll never operate in it. And everything will always be hit or miss, scattershot, kind of, you know, up and down. Someday maybe you'll get a healing, maybe you won't get a healing, depending on how I, on the scale of being good this week and, and all that stuff, which has nothing to do with it. All of that has been fulfilled. Now we are the children of God. And it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we'll be like Him. Praise the Lord. We are as He is in this world. So for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of Him that called you. In other words, this didn't come from God. This, this antichrist, this non-believing of who you are didn't come from God. 
And he says a little leaven will, leaven the whole, will spoil the whole lump. A little law, a little religion, a little uh, on that negative side of it will ruin everything. This persuades, okay, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. This is the beast nature. That's what he's referring to here. The beast. The animal like kind of behavior. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Yeah. When, you, when we start that, we're, we come out of the love for one another, the love for God and the love for one another, we, be, we go back to that old nature, which is the beast nature, which wants to bite and devour and take advantage and do all these things that are not spiritual. Right. They're carnal, right. right? So the flesh lusts against the spirit. Your body struggles with the spirit. That's why our minds have to be renewed. That's why Jesus, that's the difference between Jesus and us. He was totally surrendered to his identity. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do things, you know. He just knew, he knew, he found himself in the scriptures. So the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Now he's not, not necessarily talking about this, but he's talking about the carnal nature, the old man, the unregenerate, the, the one that, that, that led us and, and guided us before we were born again. And the thing that causes us to not see ourselves as God's children, as God's offspring. So the flesh, and these are contrary to the one, one to the other. They're, they don't, they, they, they can't cooperate. So that you cannot do the things that you would. This, I say then, walk in the Spirit, walk in this awareness and this knowledge of you, amen, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Amen? All right. See, it's, he's talking about Christ's nature or human nature. The nature of God or the beast nature. That's, that's the battle, okay? God wants to renew the nature of people so that they can be renewed back to their God's, God identity. Adam was, the spirit was breathed into him and God life came to him, right? Yes. All right, so that's what we get renewed to. That's what we get born again to. All right, so the, look, he wants to get us back to the spirit. Not to just have the spirit, but have the spirit be the dominant yes. part of us. All right, look at Galatians here again. Uh, this is, if you can go back to 15 and then just through, back through 17 here. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. On to 16 and 17. We talked about that being the beast. This I say then, don't be that beast. Don't be the beast. Amen. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, which is to devour, is to divide and bicker and so forth. The flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other so that you can't, if you're there, you can't do the things of God. You can't do the things that God has told us we're capable of doing. Laying hands on the sick, seeing them recover. Prophetic words, you know, deliverance, healing, all the things that God says we have the capacity to do as His children, just the same as Jesus. We're heirs and joint heirs of all of that. But if we operate in the old nature, in the beast nature, we bite and devour each other rather than loving one another and healing each other and bringing, you know, the good things of God into this world. Exactly. Amen? So, religion has basically taught we should be afraid. Uh, we ought to be fearful of these, uh, well, I'm going to call them just carnal concepts, which is the beast mm -hmm. saying it's a, you know, it's a money system. Yes. You know, when they came out with the... Uh, universal uh, pricing code never because oh here it is the mark of the beast yeah. here it comes they're going to be wanting to put it in our forehead and on our hands so we can go get our stuff and 
You know, all these, I mean, just uh, there's a, some new concept that comes up all the time, but that's just, that's just one of them. It, whatever concept we might have about who the beast is. But in reality, see, as long as we're pointing to the beast being something else, we're not going to ever deal with it. That's how the enemy wants us to operate. Well, he's coming. We don't know when, but he's going to be showing up someday. And we'll know him because he's got horns. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You'll know him when you start looking here. Amen. In reality, the beast is the impulse that lurks in our very members. It causes us to deny ourselves as God's children, as God's identity in the earth. That's what the beast is all about. That's who the beast is. Amen. John 8 and verse 12. It's kind of like, you know, we, Charlie Brown, we've found the enemy and he's us. In that sense, it's true. That's not our identity, but we can function from that identity. We know we can because we do. So then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen? Whenever the law is preached, there's a veil, it, it becomes dark again. And it becomes all about you. Your flesh getting stuff done, doing this and doing that in order to be accepted by God. You are, that's the point. You have been accepted by God. You have been redeemed. You're not... We don't pray, I'm going to be the righteousness. You are the righteousness of God. Yes. I heard, uh, I think it was Creflo Dollar say this the other, the other day. I don't remember now when it was, but I heard him say, and it just really struck me. He said that he had been praying and the Lord said to him, he was saying, I believe. I, I believe for my financial, or I believe for uh, increase. I believe there's no lack. I think maybe that was exactly the way he said it. I believe there's no lack. I believe there's no lack. He was making confessions. And he said he heard the Lord speak to him and say, do you really? And he said, well, yeah, I just said it. And he said, no, if you really believe that, you would just say there is no lack. This isn't based on your believing. It's a done thing. If you believe it, there just is no lack, regardless of what you're seeing, regardless of what you're experiencing, there just isn't any lack because God said there's no lack. Do you see what I'm saying? It sounds kind of like a small thing, but actually it, it messes with our mind the way that we think. I believe, therefore I receive. No, you just have received and you, you just need to operate from that reality instead of constantly talking about what you believe or don't believe. This is all about the faith of Jesus. His faith has made all of this available to us. All we do is operate as a result of that. Praise the Lord. So then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All right, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Sally asked me what I was preaching this morning. She asked me that last night, and I said, I have no idea. It's so convoluted, I don't even know if I can make sense out of it. But I mean, I know what I'm trying to say. I just hope I'm making sense out of it some way that makes sense to you. But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should, he just said, walk out, of, come out of darkness and into light, right? A holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people, but are now a people. Amen. Which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Right. Praise the Lord. So that's, he's telling us that we have, we were this, but we're not that anymore. Yes. We were darkness, but we're not in darkness anymore. We're in the light. Yes. We were once a fallen people. We were a messed up, separated people, but now we're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We are the children of God. Yes. That's your identity. And when you, do, when you understand that, you'll walk in light and not in the darkness. Praise the Lord. So when we walk in darkness or when we, when we allow darkness into our lives, the beast rules. He's on the throne. Praise the Lord. The mark of the beast. Oh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So when we don't allow the beast on the throne, Jesus reigns. We, how many of you know we are the temple of God? This is where he's seated. 
right? When we allow darkness, when we operate in darkness, meaning not understanding, not realizing who we are, what we are, the beast is sitting on the throne. He's ruling. He's, do he's keeping you from operating. He's keeping Jesus from operating and dominating your life. Yes. Keeping you from, whole, from, from your healings and from your break financial breakthroughs and from deliverance and all of those things. Okay? But when we don't allow the beast on the throne, Jesus rules. Yes. That's what he's talking about. Yes. I've called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Into the light of the revelation of who Jesus is and who you are relative to that. Amen? So there have been times in all of our lives, amen, where we have been overcome by the beast's nature. Amen. Everybody that's ever been born on this earth has at one time or another allowed him to sit on the throne. Amen. All right. Revelation 13 and verse 4. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now again, you know, naturally we, we think, okay, this thing is coming, and who's going to be able to defeat him? I'm telling you, that's not what this is about. It's about what I've been talking about here. Who can defeat this thing? Yes. Amen? The lamb in the midst of you. If we go on and continue to read it, he says the lamb, he will make war with the beast. The Jesus in you will make war yes. with the beast nature in you. If you have sense enough to realize, yes. both of them aren't going to be on the throne at the same time. You have to put the one on the throne. <clears throat> Amen? So where's the beast's authority? The carnal mind. That's why he says you've got to have your mind renewed to the Word of God. Otherwise, even though you are this child of God, the beast will still dominate. Mm -hmm. wow. If you don't know your identity, if you don't know how God sees you, then that thing is going to be the thing that's controlling. Uh -huh. And it will keep you from your inheritance. Yes. Yeah. It will keep you from, your, from who you are in Christ. It will, it will keep Jesus in the dark yeah. in this world. Instead of having Him being illuminated where everybody can see Him and experience Him, it will keep Him covered up. Right. See, the mark of the beast is received. The, the scriptures, I'm not going to go out there and read all of it because most of all you have heard this stuff anyway. But the mark of the beast is received in the forehead or in the right hand. Amen. And again, because of the way it's been taught, we figure that must be literal. So we're going to see people running around with 666 on their forehead tattooed and on their right hand, right? I mean, that's what I've always been told, and that's, you know, kind of the way we've understood it. So which means the, the, the mark of the beast is similar to the seal of God that we just read about. It's the thing that identifies you. Yes. Amen. All right. Look at Ephesians 1. And verse 13. In whom he also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit and promise. All right, I'm saying the mark of the beast and the seal of God are not the same thing, but they're like each other. We're not talking about Somebody coming down the pipe, you know, with a hammer and a chisel that's going to chisel out, uh, you know, your, uh, this thing on your forehead and your hand so you can be identified as the Antichrist or Antichrist. Right. Amen? When God put His Spirit in us, He sealed us to the day of redemption, right? He sealed us with His blood. Amen? Now, I don't, I'm looking out here at all you, and I don't see a literal seal on your foreheads. And I've shaken hands with all of you at one time or another, and I've never seen a seal on your right hand. I've never seen a mark or a, anything on your hands, right? Amen. But I know you've been sealed. Yeah. Because the scripture tells me you have been. So I don't need to see a mark on you to know exactly. that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Right. Amen? The seal of God is simply the mind of Christ. Yes. That's why he tells us, you have, Paul said, you have the mind of Christ, put on the mind of Christ. Amen? And it's, it's an operation of God's Spirit working in us. Okay? The mind of Christ and the Spirit operating in us. That's the seal. Alright, the flip side of this, the mark of the beast, 
is a reprobate mind. See, it's not a seal. I mean, it's, they're sealed because they do not believe. It's called reprobate. It's a reprobate mind. Let me, I'm just going to show you a couple of things, just examples. There's plenty of them, but I'll just use a couple of them from Job. Job chapter 23 and verse 9. See, the right hand he talks about is either God operating because we are seated at the right hand of the Father, right, in Christ. All power and authority. So it's either the right hand of God operating or it's the right hand of man. Amen. Our works trying to make us righteous. We either are the righteousness of God seated at the right hand of God or we it's our right hand trying to make something happen. Right. So the seal is in us. It's the seal of God, the seal of the Holy Spirit. In his right hand, he says, on the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. He said he's doing stuff. But I can't, I can't see how he's doing it. Now, Job didn't have the Holy Spirit. But he said, it's the right hand of God that's doing this stuff. I just can't see. I can't figure it out, right? All right, look at uh, Job 40 and verse 14, I think it is. And now here's God talking to Job. He, he goes through this little kind of monologue about, you know... Show your majesty. Show me your majesty. This is God talking to Job. He says, show me your majesty. Show me your glory. Show me your power. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save you. In other words, God is saying, show me, show me that you have me, and then I'll show you that, then I'll tell you that your right hand, your own right hand could save you. But unless you can do that, your right hand is just human works. You see what I'm saying? And that's what we hear all the time about... You know, he tells us, it's not by works, but by my spirit. Yes. You're not saved by your effort, by your human effort. Yes. That's the beast. That's the mark of the beast. Can you, are, you, are you still making any sense? So it's the reprobate mind and the effort or the thinking that we have the ability to make ourselves like God by doing good things. Not that we shouldn't do good things, but they aren't the thing that define us. We have already been defined as the righteousness of God. And that should just be a result of that, not an expectation to glory by doing it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Matthew 15, verses 2 through 6. And I'm saying, this might just, you know, might be just candy coating or something, just, you know, because it kind of makes you think differently. But I think it's critical. It's what God is trying to show us throughout the entire Bible, including the book of Revelation, that this is about an identity issue that Adam had in the very beginning, and it has flowed all the way through, and then Jesus comes with the true identity. Hope, I'm glad there's nobody in the front two rows except Sally, because I'm spitting everywhere. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, this is the issue. It isn't... It isn't what church you, in terms of, you know, Baptist, Methodist, whatever. The only problem with that is if they're not giving you Jesus, your identity in Jesus, then it's just a bunch of religion that may make you a better, a more moral person, but it won't make you godlike. It won't make you like Christ, which is who we are and what we have to be in order for God's glory to fill the earth. In order for the last days to be the last days, God's got to show up big time in us. Amen. And we have to know who we are in order for that to happen because otherwise we're going to keep looking at our flesh that fails and say, well, I wasn't good enough this week. Maybe next month I'll be able to do all the things I'm supposed to do because I'll be really, I'm, going to, I'm determined I'm going to be really good for the next 30 days. And I'll get about one hour into that and I'll have it screwed up and then I'll have to start over and over and over and we just never get there. It's always being pushed, pushed, pushed into the future. But today is the day of salvation. Yes. Now is the time for God to shine. Yes. Amen. So why do these thy disciples transgress? Now this is the this is the Pharisees. They say, why do you why are your disciples transgressing, or why are they sinning the tradition against the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he, Jesus answered and said unto them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. He that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father and his mother, It's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. 
and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now, at, there's a lot of stuff going on there that I'm not going to get into, but it's, it's really, this is about, you can see these characteristics in the church. Man, by his tradition, has made void and ineffective the Word of God. Yeah. Amen? The word tradition literally speaks of the spirit of Antichrist. Mm. Why? Because it's something people use as a substitute for the real relationship with God. What I do or don't do. Right? That's the spirit of Antichrist. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's what the Pharisees were doing in the book of Matthew. They were transgressing the commandment of God by following the tradition instead of the word. Nope. Amen. Jesus t taught this over and over. It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him. Yes. They were saying, they're not washing their hands and now they're going to eat. Yeah. They'll, 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 be, they'll be defiled. And they'll defile everybody else and the food that they touch and all the other stuff. And Jesus told him, he said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Yes. Yes. Amen. Now, I suggest you wash your hands before you eat. But I'm saying, if you don't, that's not your problem. The problem is you saying stuff that isn't in agreement with the Word of God. That denies who you are. That defiles you. That's what, that's what keeps you from experiencing everything that you're supposed to experience in God. Yes. Amen? So once the beast is exposed, he can be taken out of the way by the spirit of the Lord's mouth. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Wow. It's, that's how you're going to operate. That's how you're going to... Once, once you know what I'm talking about here, then you can, you can deal with him by what comes out of your mouth. As long as it's not defiled. As long as it's in agreement with the Word of God. Amen. And how do you do it? By the Spirit of the Lord's mouth and the brightness of His coming. Meaning that He's back on the throne. It's now Jesus on the throne because you're saying what Jesus says instead of agreeing, I'm this worthless, no good, I can't do it. You know, I'm going to have to pray through. I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to fast. I'm going to have to do this. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But those things are just a re reaction, a, a response to what God has already done, not trying to make that happen. Right. Once you're born again, you're born again. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, look, look at this. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. This is scripture we, we all have heard plenty of times. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me read it. This is, this is the Amplified. I've got that big one up here and I, could, I can do it. But It says, all Scripture... All Scripture is God-breathed. Every Scripture is God-breathed, given by His inspiration, profitable for instruction, for reproof, for conviction of sin, correction of error, and, dis and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, holy living, conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action, so that the man of God may be complete, proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So... It's the Word of God spoken in season that comes for instruction, reproof. It begins to slay the wicked one that lurks in our members, the flesh. Amen. So that the man of God, you and me, begin living by the Spirit, living complete and able to be proficient, well-fitted, thoroughly equipped for every God work or good work. Praise the Lord. It's what God says yes. that dethrones the beast. Sure. Sure. Amen. Second Peter 1, verses 17 through 19. Second Peter 1, 17 through 19.
For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in you. I said this many, several different times, but I was here praying. This has been several years ago. And we were going through something, uh, as we tend to be <laughs> doing every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the Lord spoke to me and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I swear, I heard it almost like an audible voice. I mean, it was in me, but it was so strong. And I thought, you're just, you're, you're just thinking this. But it was so unthought of. I mean, I wasn't like thinking about it or anything else. It just came. And that's what God is saying to all of us. He's, what he, how He loved Jesus is how He loves us. But, we, but see, it was such a shock to me because I've never thought of myself as His beloved Son. I've thought of myself as being... Well, he's a son, but man, you know, I tolerate him, but I'm not, you know, I, he, he kind of gets on my nerves sometimes, and he just rubs me the wrong way, and you know what I mean? That's kind of how I, my feeling, I'm trying to do everything I can to be your favorite. You know, it's like sibling rivalry, but that's not what, see, God sees every one of us as this beloved son. Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And if we could ever get that revelation, can you see how that would change everything? That's how Jesus understood Himself at His baptism. That's what God said to Him. And He was, he was living His life like I'm the, you know, I'm the one. I'm the, I'm the main one. I'm, I'm the one that always gets the biggest slice of cake. How I'm the one that gets the, the new clothes, not the hand-me-downs. I'm the one, you know what I'm saying? I'm His favorite. He's spoiling me, and he don't care who knows it. See, that, that has to be, we've got to get a mind shift. We've got to change our thinking in order to function the way we have to function. Jesus did it because he knew who he was. And we've heard who we are, but we've also heard conflicting testimony. Praise the Lord. Amen. And it's come from our own unrenewed mind. And every time we buy into that, the beast is back on the throne. Praise the Lord. So since every scripture is the word of God, and is God breathed, according to 2 Timothy, then it begins to make war with that man of sin. The old nature. The human nature. The beast. Amen. And then light overcomes darkness. Praise the Lord. Alright, let's... Hebrews chapter 4, 12 through 16. We'll move along here pretty quick. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 4, 12 through 16. For the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joint and the marrow, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither, think of it now in the context of what we're talking about. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. And, and the word of God will make it manifest. It will make that creature, whatever it is, manifest that is not manifest in his sight but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast our profession yes. I am the righteousness of God in Christ yes. I'm not believing that I'm the righteousness of Christ I am the righteousness of God in Christ Amen. For we have not a, a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our flesh, our human being, because he was completely human. But was in all points tempted like as we are, but without sin. Praise God. You're without sin. You can be tempted. You can even fail. You know, I'm talking about in the natural. But you are still perfect. You are still without sin. Because Jesus either took it all or he didn't take any of it. So let us therefore, because of not this knowledge, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help for anything, anytime. See, if you know and keep that profession, you're not, you're not timid about coming to God for whatever your need is. 
because you know it's already yours. He rejoices in the fact that we receive it, that we believe that it's ours. Amen? All right. Now, let me, let's just go way off here on another path. Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 15 through 25. And we're talking about types and shadows and metaphors and all this stuff. Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the beast. We know that because when he was lifted up in his own self, what happened? He ended up eating grass and living like a cow or a beast of some kind out in the field, right? So we know that that's the metaphor that's being used here. And so recognizing that in the context of what this, this story is telling us about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you be ready, to, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sacrament, the, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, fall down and worship the image which I have made. What was the image? The image was Nebuchadnezzar. Amen. And uh, uh, that I made well. But if you don't worship, you will be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? If it be so, they're responding. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from that burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But be not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve their gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. The beast gets angry because he, 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 he won't let him have his seat. Somebody else is in his seat, right? Then his, the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the fire once seven more times than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And... Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire flew or slew the men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the guys that were going to throw them into the furnace, they get scorched. They get burned up. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the beast, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Didn't we throw three guys in there? Bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto thee, That's true, king. That's exactly what we did. He answered and said, But I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now I'm saying that God, I believe God is raising up a people in the earth who are not going to dance to the tune of tradition. Praise the Lord. They're not going to dance to the tune of religion. They're not going to dance to the human nature, the, tune, the, 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 the songs of human nature, amen, or the carnal mind, or the nature of the beast. Praise, Praise the Lord. A people that will say, we are not going to bow, yes. beast, O king, we're not, we're not submitting to you. Amen. Look at Romans 8 now, verses 11 through 14. Romans 8, 11 through 14. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, or to the beast. Amen. For if you live after that, you shall die. But if the, through the spirit you mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see what he's saying? If you're led by Jesus on the throne, Son of God, you're, you've got the benefits. You are functioning as Christ in the earth. If the beast is on the throne, you're, you're as good as dead. Amen? And so the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, and we are not even careful how we're going to answer you. In other words, we're not... We don't have to second guess this thing. We already know what we're going to say no matter what happens. Yeah. Because we know who we are and we know who our God is. Yes. Amen. Amen. If it takes us into the fiery furnace, we know our God is able to deliver us. Amen. To be delivered from the beast, how does it, what does it say in the book of Revelation? You have to be put to death. Yes. If you got the mark of the beast, Woo. you're going to die. Uh -huh. Amen. You have to be put to death because whoever does not receive his mark must be killed with a sword. 
All right? <laughs> That's why we can say with Paul, it's no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Amen? Slain by the sword, which is the word of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who went into the fiery furnace, looked as if their destiny was death. They were going to die. But all the fire did was burn off the ropes that had them bound. The fire destroyed those who threw them in the furnace. And it produced the fourth man in the midst of them. They put Jesus on the throne. And they came out without the smell of smoke on them. This is the kind of gospel where Jesus has preeminence. Where he is everything. No longer a trace of smoke. No longer a trace of the old nature. Just Jesus in the midst. Seated on the throne. Galatians 4, we'll, we'll wrap up here. Galatians 4, 28 through 31. I want to go all the way to 5, but I don't think you can do that without stopping and starting, Peter. So, 4, 28 through 5, 1. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now get it. Again, this is a true story, but he's given us the metaphor, and it's the same one we've been seeing over and over here today. It's all throughout the Bible, everywhere that you look. We are the children of promise. We are promised children. We're born again, born from above, right? But as then, as it was then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. And it's the same way now, he says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. In other words, get the beast out of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. They can't reign together. Right. Amen. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It's been burnt. We've been set free, right? The fire burnt the, the, the thing that kept them bound. And that's how Jesus in the midst of them. Keep that the focus. The liberty that we've received because of the Word of God, because of who we are in Christ. But the religion and the beast nature, that human nature, that old man wants to suck you back into the fire, back into the you know, torment, and you have to do everything yourself. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We've been set free from that, but we have to keep that the focus. That has to remain our focus, that liberty of who we are in God. That it's not up to me. Jesus has already taken care of all of it. I just get to benefit of all of it. I just walk in the knowledge of who I am, that I am His beloved Son in whom He's well pleased, and nothing shall be withheld from me. Praise God. All right, last scripture. Back to Psalms 24, and we'll read verses 6 through 10. Now remember, David said, who's the guy that gets God's presence? The one whose hands are clean and who is perfect, right? This is just a continuation of that. This is the generation that seek Him, that seek His face, that are looking for Him and not for us. Amen? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. That's us. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. We are the temple of God. That's what He's referring to here. And the King of glory shall come in. He'll be seated. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Think about it. Praise the Lord. This is the generation. Yes. Lift up your heads. Yes. Get your thinking right. Yes. Praise the Lord. And the King of Glory comes in yep. and rules mighty in battle. Yes. Yep. Amen. He will destroy the beast yes. with the sword of his mouth. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's us. Yes. If we, it, it, whatever generation it is that buys this lock, stock, and barrel yeah. exactly. is the generation 
that's going to see the greatest move of God this earth has ever seen or will ever see. Praise the Lord. When Jesus is on the throne, I mean, you know, the king, whatever the king says, is law. Praise the Lord. It has to be obeyed. Amen? Every knee has to bow to the name of Jesus. Cancer, poverty, sickness, disease, whatever it is. When you know who you are, Jesus is on the throne, and you open your mouth, every devil in hell shakes. He's been dethroned. Praise the Lord. And God is in charge again. That's our inheritance. That's who we are in Christ. We've got to just, we've got to believe it. We've got to confess it. We've got to tell ourselves this every time. No matter how stupid we are, no matter how ignorant we act, no matter how bad we fail, we are still the righteousness of God. And God needs that in order to have a way into this earth. He needs a body. A human body filled with God. The devil can't handle it. Praise the Lord. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen, amen. I'm feeling pretty good about myself right now. I hope you all are too. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. Everybody have a great time. Amen. Enjoy the day. Enjoy your identity in Jesus. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.